Great. Uh, welcome everybody to my talk on Russian military thought, Russian fascism, and Putin's war in Ukraine. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, and I want to just briefly talk about the ideological roots of the war. Uh, th there's three aspects here. There's the extreme violence. Uh, there are the justifications of the war that have not moved rank and file soldiers. And um, Putin's constant references to Ukraine as a Nazi power that are not really based in reality. And I'm trying to figure out how can these things be explained? And one of the ways that we can explain these things is by looking at the concept of fascism. And the talk look, argues that fascism has become widespread among Russian elites, especially in the army and Putin, uh, but it can't be given uh, the form of a mass ideology. So it is charging other people with a crime of fascism. And this is what Timothy Snyder calls uh, schizofascism. Okay, so when we're looking at a definition of fascism, uh, we need to think about how to do it. Uh, it's difficult to have a descriptive definition, sort of like the following three things, uh, because not all fascism uh, falls under those different uh, categories. So they can include the things you see on the screen, ultranationalism, dictatorship, racism, violence, and so on, uh, but they're not found in every single case. Right? So this more abstract uh, definition is, is a better one. And uh, it's this idea that fascism is always A and not A, right? And so for example, the Nazis were called the National Socialist Party. They both called themselves socialists and rejected and murdered socialists. They implemented <clears throat> certain aspects of socialism, rejected others. And you see this simul simultaneous rejection and accept acceptance uh, in Russian fascism today. And that's not like an exception, that's more characteristic. So let's look at the debate over Russian fascism because this is definitely part of a live debate and I am coming down on one side of it rather than the other. So it's important to understand uh, the different sides so uh, on the one side, we have Marlene Laruel. She's written very extensively about fascism in Russia. Uh, she's working within the realist tradition. She's skeptical of the use of morals in politics. So her argument and her frame rejects the idea of Russia as a fascist state. Uh, at the same time, she produces a tremendous amount of evidence, very meticulous, uh, you know, very well done, that could easily be uh, made to make the opposite argument. So the person who's arguing against Laurel is Timothy Snyder. Uh, there are others, but these are the two kind of big figures in the field. Uh, so in The Road to Unfreedom, <clears throat> he traces the spread of fascist ideas among the Russian elite. Uh, he shows this direct influence on Putin. Uh, and he focuses on the level of high politics. So I'm doing something different than either of them and the other people who are working on it. I'm looking at it specifically um, through the military, through military periodicals and other publications. People have tended to focus more on, on Putin and his own thought. Okay, so a really big person for this talk is gonna be Alexander Dugan. Um, and both Snyder and LaRuel agree in calling Dugan a fascist. Um, and so his life's work has been to make fascism acceptable in Russia. He's published very widely, uh, especially a lot of textbooks, and he very much influenced the post-1991 Russian military. Uh, so just, just to start, here, here are some of the symbols of the National Bolshevik Party, uh, of which Dugan was a founding member. It's pretty clear what's going on here and what they're, work, what they're working with. Note the name, National Bolshevik Party. Uh, it's not just taking off from the Nazi name, but very typical of that A and not A, right? It's Nazis and Bolsheviks together, A and not A. Okay, so his key text is this Foundations of Geopolitics. It was published in Moscow in 1997. And um, it's, 
it's a very successful textbook. It's been widely used uh, in the General Staff Academy and other academies in Russia. And in it, he argues there's this inevitable conflict between sea-based civilizations, such as the US and the UK, and land-based ones like Russia. Um, there are a lot of uh, you know, Nazi terms, occultism, and other things going on in, in this textbook. And I chose this one really almost at random. Uh, you know, it's not like this is the most clear. It's just, this is one that, that just caught my eye at the time. Uh, you know, the, the Russian drawing of Osten and Norden is the true geopolitical process of Russian history. And of course that's, you know, drive to the East and then, you know, what the Nazis talked about. Okay, so more on foundations of geopolitics. So it argues that Russia must be an empire, must expand territorially. Uh, the US and the UK are Atlanticists and they're the main and eternal enemy. Uh, so there's gonna be a redivision of the world. That's from part four, chapter three. There are these, be these three axes or alliances, Moscow, Berlin, Moscow, Tokyo, Moscow, Tehran. And he uses this term Eurasia, which for him is, is mainly a synonym for the geographical term heartland. Um, it's the classic land-based power. So he rejects all these things, you know, globalization, American power, human rights. And there were these earlier Eurasianists, such as Lev Gumilyov. Um, they are a complicated group. They're in the 1920s, 1930s. They talk about this kind of continental messianism that Russia has this special kind of goal, special, you know, um, mission within human, you know, society and, and history. Uh, and that is to be this continental power. But in a lot of ways, he's using the term Eurasianism to make it sound more Russian, to kind of ground fascism within the Russian context, rather than being mainly influenced by the Eurasianists. So relevant to us here is what Foundation says about Ukraine. So um, here it says, the sovereignty of Ukraine presents such a negative phenomenon for Russian geopolitics that in principle, it may easily promote, provoke armed conflict. And it also states that uh, Ukraine as an independent state with some territorial ambitions presents itself as a great danger to all of Eurasia. Uh, and it's especially crucial that Russia retake the North shore of the Black Sea. That's his big focus, right? So that sort of Southern strategy that we actually uh, see happening today in the war, that's very much his focus. Um, so for him, it's not anything that Ukraine has done, it's just that it exists, right? Uh, that it exists as a separate uh, country, as a separate state, that is the danger that he sees. Okay, so this is in his book, 343. It's a map of South Russia, which should serve as the basis for the future geographical expansion of Russia to the South. Number two is Romania, Moldova. Uh, and number three is Crimea and Southeast Ukraine. Uh, so Romania is part of uh, NATO. Uh, Moldova is uh, now, you know, uh, taking part in these talks to hopefully join the EU quickly because people saw the Lukashenko map of potential invasions of Moldova. And of course, Crimea and Southeast Ukraine, those were things that have already happened in 2014. So, so this again, um, is something that's been a textbook in military academies for some time, right? This is also relevant, Russia as a Eurasian empire. Uh, it's, it's very interesting because you can see here, Finland is part of it. The Baltic states are not part of it. Here is Kiev, uh, Kichinyov. So we've got once again, Moldova and Mongolia and, and all of that. So, I mean, I think it's reasonable to just say, well, this is kind of nutty stuff and this is a fringe kind of thing. And, you know, these aspirations, you, every society has people with these kind of, you know, ideas and, and platforms and projects. And does it really matter? Uh, is this really significant? All right, so this is what Sergei Ivanov, the Russian Minister of Defense, said in 2002. Um, I dare assure you that Russia has rejected globalism, which was inherent in the development of the armed forces in the times of Soviet Union. 
Uh, however, it should always be borne in mind that we are a vast land-based power with the longest borders in the world. Now, the interesting thing here is that land-based here sort of functions as, uh, as a kind of dog whistle. If you read this not knowing about Dugan, you would not really have an issue with this statement. You would not consider it problematic because of course, you know, Russia is a land-based power in that sense. But when you start to understand that, that at this time, Dugan is extremely active uh, in the general staff and, in, and is published widely, uh, and uh, even Knopf is um, somebody who is approving these kind of things, we start to see that this quote is, is telling in, an, in another and more disturbing kind of way. Right. So, um, so let's talk about the ways that Dugan has been cl close to Russian military, especially in the 1990s. So he regularly met with the general staff. The, the lectures that he gave to them were the basis of the textbook. Uh, the textbook was commissioned by General Igor Rodionov. Um, he brought in this French New Right thinker, Alain de Benoit, to meet with the general staff. Actually, it's sort of interesting uh, De Benoit was so turned off by what he considered to be the low cultural level of the general staff that he actually broke with uh, Dugan for a while uh, and they, they made up later. Uh, so they're still, uh, they are at present still collaborating in various things. And this is just part of this larger effort to rehabilitate Nazism, uh, including Nazi collaborators. Um, and La Ruel talks about this, and I'm not going to get into all the details, but there were a whole bunch of different things that were going on at, at this time. And his contacts with the general staff were only part of it, but they definitely did exist and um, they were influential. 